So today I wanted to show you another microgreens recipe a little further through. So we've got some redwood sorrel or red sorrel. You can find uh, redwood sorrel growing native out in the forest here in Upper Campus, but this is a red violet sorrel, which is a little different, but uh, related. And then we've also got some uh, young scallion microgreens here. So I'm gonna kind of show you a little bit of a hodgepodge of like, I've got some things in the fridge. I went to the pantry today and I grabbed a couple things and I'm just gonna show you how I put a bunch of pieces together here. So we've got some kale, we've got some cauliflower, we've got some rosemary, and we've got our microgreens. Additionally, we've got a little bit of squash and then I have some leftover pie dough. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna make uh, some squash empanadas. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. So to start off, you wanna always think about how long all the pieces are gonna take for them to fit together. So you wanna do things, if things are gonna roast in the oven, you wanna start with that piece first. So first we've got our squash. Now there are a lot of different types of squash out here. I think this is a type of Aztec squash. Um, it looks like the like Mayan or Aztec squash. It's a small squash that's great for roasting. Um, usually for most squash, the principle is the same. I like to squat, uh, roast it with the skin on. I actually think the skin is really delicious. If you get a really big squash and the skin's really thick, you might want to peel it, but it's very time intensive. So because we're roasting this to go inside of the empanadas, the first thing we want to do is roast this off. So we're going to start, we know that we have seeds in the middle, so we're going to start by halving it. So we've got our seeds in here. And we're going to scrape like so. So I'm just scooping out the insides here. If you want, you can always save these seeds and toast them for toasted pumpkin seeds. I can show you how to do that. A um, little bit time in intensive, but can be really delicious. So, and you can also save the seeds for growing more of the squash and check out some videos coming up from Kelly um, about seed saving. So we also have these little um, stems here. So we're gonna wanna just make a wedge cut and remove those stems on both sides. This has a little bit of a ring. You don't want that, that's not gonna taste good. So we're gonna cut that out. And it'll snap off nicely. Same thing here, curve cut. I'm cutting towards myself, so I wanna be careful. In general, try not to cut towards yourself too often, but there are times where it's unavoidable. You can just go away from yourself here. Little wedge shape cut. I drank a lot of coffee this morning, so you'll notice I'm a little shaky. Always uh, good to try to drink some water and eat some breakfast if you can. Um, then, you know, we've got this curve here. I like to cut this up into just even sized pieces. The important thing here, because we're gonna puree this, we're gonna roast it and puree it, is that they're even sized so they cook evenly. So I'm just gonna cut it crossways here. Then I've got this. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work this into wedges. So I'm gonna start and I'm gonna make a cut here. I'm gonna turn the squash, make another wedge shape cut. And I keep turning it, flipping it around 180, making an angled cut. And this just gives you like little chaotic wedges. Um, you know, not how everyone would cut a squash, but it's how I cut a squash. Um, and I find that it looks really great on the plate if you're keeping it like this. When you roast it, you get these kind of wonderful wedge shaped pieces. And I think that it looks really good that way. There's a lot of other ways you can do it. You can try to make them square, but you're gonna spend a lot of time thinking about it because squash is not square. So I, you know, why would you try to make a circle a square? Um, I mean, you can do it, but the world is not square. There are very few crops that are square. I like showing the natural shape of things. So now we've got this, we're gonna roast this off. So I'm gonna grab a roasting pan I'm gonna preheat my oven to 400 degrees. And then I'm gonna throw this in here. I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil. Just enough to cover them. Make sure they don't stick to the pan too much. I've got some of my pre-ground pepper and cumin. 
a little bit of that. Some salt. I'm going to go with two three finger pitches here. So grabbing it with three fingers, just enough. The key, maybe three now that I'm looking at it. Um, the key with salt, really for me, I like to, depends on how much salt you like. I like things a little saltier, but when you toss it, you should know by feeling it. You should be able to just feel the grains of the salt on there. If you don't feel it, it's probably undersalted. If you feel it really thickly on there, you've probably oversalted it and you can always rinse it. So I like to go by feel when I toss it, which is why I, I use my hands a lot and I tend to veer away from gloves. Gloves are theoretically more sanitary, but the honest truth is a lot of people don't wash their hands or change their gloves as much when they're wearing gloves. They think they're invincible. So as long as you're washing your hands really regularly, um, you should have nice clean hands. Um, last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have a little bit of rosemary in there for some nice roast, roasty flavors. So taking this off. So I'm going to take two sprigs of rosemary here and I'm going to strip them. And the way I do that is I grip it and I pull down in the opposite direction of what they're growing. So I have this here, put this to the side. And then at the end you have to pull with it, but I'm just gonna grab this rosemary here. So I'm stripping. And then I'm just gonna rough chop this up. And I think seeing two sprigs, this is pretty high yield, might be a little much for the amount of squash that we have here in the pan. So probably just gonna set some of this aside for later and do about half of that. It's all a matter of taste. You know, you get used to kind of eyeballing how much should be in things. Um, recipes are great, um, but realistically, you should learn the principles of, of how much things should uh, be added. I would say always err on the lighter side of, of, of pieces, and you can always add more later. Um, and you'll learn from practice, like what's too much herbs. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with a lot of herbs. Some recipes call for things to be completely crusted in herbs and those can be really delicious. You do get some bitterness. Um, so now I've got all my pieces here. I'm going to tilt my pan. So bringing it up helps with the gravity and you can just toss it. And same thing when you're tossing a salad, tilting it makes a big difference. So I've got those nicely coated. I'm feeling it. I feel some grain, but it's not like thickly, thickly coated with salt. Um, so now that I've got it, I'm going to wash my hands. <laughs> yeah, the end of the scene section here. And I'm gonna pop it in the oven for about 90 minutes. Um, luckily, I have some pre-made squash puree already made over here so we can show that later. Um, next, I'm gonna kind of thinking backwards here. We've got our uh, kale we need to wash. So we're going to do similar to the rosemary. We're going to strip the kale off the stem. These are always fun. So gripping, and it pull it in the opposite direction. Get it off the stem here. Now kale is a very interesting leafy green. It's a brassica. One thing about kale that you want to always remember is that it's very tough um, and increasingly tough the bigger it is, but you can massage it in cold water and that makes a big difference. So you would want to give your kale a massage. So I like to keep big pieces for massaging before I wash and cut it. So keep it in the biggest possible pieces you can to start. And then after you wash and massage it, you can cut it, but you can be a lot more effective at massaging it. If it's bigger pieces, it's a lot easier. Small pieces are kind of trickier to massage, especially for me, I've got, you know, larger hands, um, so it's, it's tougher to uh, massage tiny little pieces of kale. So I like to have nice big strips, but in general I do think it's easier to keep it larger to more effectively massage it. So stripped off the stem here, this is beautiful kale, 
Um, I believe this is from Live Earth Farm. Uh, we're planting out our brassicas at Caspis right now, but we don't have any coming in out of the field right now. So I'm gonna put this here in my spinner and I'm gonna start massaging it in. So I'm really working it and then soaking in cold water and that releases some of the bitterness. So massaging it really good. You know, you can even put ice water. I, I don't think, I think that's a little bit of overkill uh, for kale. Okay, so I've got it filled with water here. I'm gonna give it a little deeper of a massage. I'm gonna leave it soaking for 10 to 20 minutes. That really makes a big difference before you spin it out. So you can see the water's already turning green. We're taking some chlorophyll out and some bitterness. It's gonna be a lot better this way. So set that aside, let it soak. Give a wipe of our counter here. We've got some goodies. Wiping your counter regularly. Really important to keep an organized workstation. You know, I've always got my pile to my right of for my stock pot um, or my compost. And you know, you want to keep your station clear and work one task at a time. Don't start things and leave piles of things everywhere. That's how kitchen accidents happen. It also just makes it a lot harder to cook. Next, we've got our cauliflower. We're gonna saute this with our scallion microgreens. So I, you know, I kind of was just thinking as I grabbed these pieces, I was like, what's gonna be really tasty? And I thought, oh, a little cauliflower with our onions. So I'm taking off these outer greens. They're not particular tasty. There is some nutritional value to them, but I tend to just compost those or feed them to my chickens. My chickens do really like those. So the sturdier greens. So I'm breaking off the stem. You can even cut it makes it easier to break this apart. Then you want to think about what size cauliflower you want. I don't love having huge big pieces of cauliflower when I cook things. I like to have things in like the right bite size pieces. So I'm going to break these off and look and I look at each piece I'm like would I want to eat that in a bite and looking at one this big I personally want about half of that when I'm grabbing a bite of something. So you can make it a lot easier for yourself if you're prepping. If you make it something that is already in bite-sized pieces, so you don't need to eat it with a fork and knife, and you can eat it in a bowl. Um, you know, when you're in college, it's nice. I mean, I, I feel like I ate sitting down a lot less when I was in college. It's nice to have something that you can kind of float around your house, perch and eat with a bowl. So you're doing a lot of the work ahead of time, and making it easier to eat. I'm breaking it off the pieces that I, I would want to eat in one bite, but I try to keep things, um, depending on how you're framing your meal, you can think about whether or not you want to have a knife and fork at the table. Okay, same thing here. I'm going to toss this all in a bowl to season it. One trick I'm going to show you, rags are very important in a kitchen. You want to always keep your rag folded because what you can do that way is, I think you end up with 12 sides. So you can take it like this and then after you've got the side dirty, you can fold it here and then you can refold it. So you can flip it inside out and refold. I'm always refolding towels in the kitchen and you can make it a lot farther. A friend of mine worked at a really high end restaurant in Chicago and the chef got so mad about how people were using rags that he mandated for a month that each person at each station only got one rag for their whole shift. And he said, you should be working clean enough that you can do that. I think that's a little bit of ghoulish overkill, but it's really important. You can make your rags last a lot longer by keeping them folded using them like this and then you know you just flip them after a use and you can get stretch a rag a lot further and make your laundry go a lot further so for seasoning this i'm going to keep our flavors consistent marry the flavors here salt pepper cumin olive oil i'm also going to add a little bit of acid so i'm going to look around and see what we've got in this kitchen but a little bit of acid is going to balance and uh, make our dish more dynamic you know, you've got salt, fat, acid, heat as the four components you want to add to dishes in general. Um, we've got some escaveche for the top for our heat from our, our pantry, but uh, we don't have any acid going into this dish aside from the escaveche. But what I'm going to do is we've got our escaveche, which our escaveche here, we offer this through the pantry. It's pickled jalapenos, carrots and some garlic and radish as well. I'm gonna use a little bit of this escaveche juice, which is vinegar and sugar and salt here to season up this cauliflower. 
and set this aside for later. We're going to use this as a garnish. So we we'll take it, tilt the bowl, use our, our fingertips to incorporate all the flavors here. Now we've got it nicely seasoned. Now we're going to saute it with some of our scallions. So we have to harvest those scallions. We've got some beautiful scallions here. So I'm going to pull right here and use my scissors. Cut, grip and cut, set them right here. So some gorgeous scallion microgreens here. A little more subtle flavor than normal scallions. They're not going to be as strong of a flavor. But they're still going to be extremely tasty and we can use a, a, a few more of them. So now we're going to get ready to saute our cauliflower and our scallions here. Um, what we really want to do is always think about what takes longer to cook. Now, intuitively, cauliflower, you know, you look at it, it clearly is a lot thicker, a lot denser than these microgreen scallions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to layer my pan in. So I'm going to start off by adding my cauliflower. I'm going to soften and, and the cauliflower. And once I see it starting to really soften and get a little brown, I'm going to add the microgreens in at the end, but I don't want to overcook those. Um, you really want to think about how long things take to cook when you're layering multiple things into the same pan. So the key with sauteing is that you always want to put a little bit of oil in your pan. We've got a nice uh, porcelain enamel pan here. Things don't stick too much. And you can either stir with a uh, spatula or as I am doing here, you can flip the pan. It's a good thing to practice with rice or something somewhere where you don't mind making a mess. But the key really is all in the wrist is that you're moving the pan forward and right when they're getting at the edge, you're snapping your hand and, and holding it and that'll make it toss back. It's really, it's a wrist action that you have to practice a fair amount is flipping things. So, um, but always make sure that your pan comes up to temperature before you drop things in. If you let the pan come up to temperature with ingredients in it, you're going to get soggier food. You want it to hit and flash, make contact. The idea is that oil is coating pieces and creating a heat seal and that keeps things from getting greasier. If you throw things into a pan before the oil is up to temperature, things just aren't going to taste as good. I like to use whole garlic cloves in a pan when I'm sauteing. Um, I think it imbues flavor really nicely and you don't get the burnt ends that you can sometimes get when you chop up garlic and do it in a pan. So with this, I'm not quite sure how long I'm going to be sauteing this cauliflower. So I'm going to keep these garlic cloves whole. So we're going to head on over to the stove. All right, so now it's getting there. It's up to temp. You can see it starts to go elastic. I'm going to add my garlic cloves here. Coat them. Wait till I hear a sizzle on these. We're going to add. All right, so now that it's starting to brown, I'm going to add my scallions here. So I've killed the heat here and I have this nice little nest here in the middle. I'm going to keep it on the stove to keep it warm and we'll come back to that later for plating. So I've got some pie dough here that I made. There's a lot of great pie dough recipes online. Um, the key really is that when you make pie dough, you want to rest it in the fridge for a while and you want to make sure that you don't overwork the dough. Um, you're layering butter in in the same way that you would layer a croissant in. So you want there to be kind of striations of butter and that's what gives it a flaky crust. If you overwork the dough, all that's going to end up happening is it's going to be super dense and it's not going to have any flakiness. So we're just making a small amount here. So I'm just going to cut off a little chunk here so I can show you with a few. I've got my dough. I'm going to work it. I'm just going to rework it a little bit, give it a little knead. So I'm just folding it, kneading it out a little bit. So I've got my flour and I've got my rolling pin. So I'm setting this down and I'm rolling it out. And the key with rolling is you want to just keep turning it 90 degrees. You're going to roll it out here, flip it over. We're going to keeping lots of flour. It can absorb a lot of flour. It's hard to over flour a dough and dry it out. So it's going to really keep it from sticking. It's going to make it a lot easier to clean your cutting board. Um, wood is ideal, but if you don't have wood, you can do this on another kind of counter. Just remember that if you're working on steel or marble, it's colder. So the dough is going to take longer to work out. 
Um, if you don't own a rolling pin, a wine bottle works great, um, or any kind of bottle, and you can always improvise. I, I had a friend who took the broken handle of a shovel, cut it and sanded it down and made it into a really nice little rolling pin similar to this style here. And this is more similar to um, a rolling pin you'd see in Asia. It's flat, you work your hands, doesn't have the greased axle on it. But I prefer this. I find you get better tactile feel for the dough. You just keep turning it, working it out. And then as far as thickness goes, say like a tangerine or clementine peel, give or take. It's nice to have it be thick, but not too thick. You definitely don't want it so thin that it's gonna stretch out. And then you need to stretch out and tear, because it will tear. So, now that we've got it out, we're gonna punch out our wrappers. You can use anything that's round here. I'm literally using one of the deli containers that we, uh, we do a lot of our distributions with because we don't even have a good cutter here, which is kind of funny and a little embarrassing, but. And then you're gonna save all your extra pieces of dough that come out here. Um, you wanna save them in a pile if you're rolling out multiple pieces. You wanna roll them all together once. The more you work dough, the denser it's gonna be. So you don't wanna do it over and over again. You really can usually only re-roll out dough about two or three times before it starts going really stiff on you. We've got our wrappers here. Gonna grab a spoon and a fork. So I've got some pre-made squash puree here. This was the roasted squash. Got pulsed in a food processor. If you can't do that, you can also just rough chop it over and over again if you don't have a food processor or a Vitamix. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna grab, if you're right-handed, put the dough wrapper in your left hand, take this puree, you really don't wanna to add too much. And I always recommend starting out with less when you first start. Um, and you can always get more stuffing in there later. So I'm spreading that out and I push it down a little bit so that it's uh, seated, seated flat. Then I bring this around to the top like a taco. You pinch at the top and then gently pinch it all the way around. Now, the issue here is you don't want to stop here because if you did, it would split open. So you want to take a fork, set it down on the counter, and then push down with your fork almost all the way through and you're creating a fan, and this is sealing it in. This is locking, and then you flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. You do the same thing with pierogies as well, and then there are some dumpling styles that do this, but dumplings tend to use folds. But now you've got pretty little empanada, and you can do that a few times. All right, now I'm gonna lay these out, laying them out on the tray. They're very gentle, you want to handle them with care. Use your fingertips. You really can change the shape of them still at this point. So you want to handle them. I'm tossing them, but I'm handling them lightly. You want to pick them up by the edge. You don't want to, you can pinch it right here and it's going to change its shape. It's not going to be as nice. And because they puff up, you want to make sure that you keep them nice and smooth. So you can kind of reshape it as you set it down, making sure it's a nice fan. And then I like to bake them at an, in an oven at about 400 degrees for 30 minutes or so. If you want, we can do a little egg wash just to make them extra pretty. So I'm just gonna take a measuring cup and take one egg. I break eggs by just tapping them on the counter. You tend to get a cleaner break than if you try to tap them on an edge. And if you don't have a brush, which we don't have one in the kitchen right now, you can use a little piece of rosemary. So just take your rosemary and use it to lightly brush on your egg wash here. And this is gonna, just gonna make them look prettier. Just to lightly work it on. Helps brown them off and make them cook more evenly. The edges tend to crisp up really fast, but the top, because there's more mass and more moisture inside, take a little longer to brown. So this kind of alleviates this so that they get a little more evenly browned. 
Now we're gonna toss these in the oven. So the kale's been soaking for a while now. We're ready to spin it. So this is pretty full here, but I'm just pushing down, spinning it nicely, getting our moisture out. So now the kale's been massaged. Look at all that moisture that came out just from spinning. The kale has been massaged and washed. And now we want to dress it. So we're going to make a simple little vinaigrette here. I use whatever we have at hand. So I always look in the fridge and we have two kind of fun things here. We've got a little prickly pear juice from last week. We juiced some um, and I've got some quince paste. So for a little bit of balance of sweet and um, you know, some more umami flavor, that's going to be great. We're going to chop our garlic just like we did last week, slip it in half, score it, make a grid. and mince it. Very fine. I'm going to go a little finer. Not too much. I don't want to extract too much bitterness here. But just take it a little further. And looking at that, half a clove is plenty. So we're going to put that into the bottom here. Set that half a clove aside for later. Now we're gonna add our, our mustard. I like a little bit of Dijon, just a tiny little dollop. And I'm just gonna put a little dollop of our quince paste here that we made, just a tiny bit. Splash of our prickly pear juice. You could also use lemon juice or anything with a little acid. We're gonna add a pinch of salt Maybe two. Remember that mustard does have salt in it, so you want to be careful thinking about the, the amount of salt that is in what you have. Some black pepper, some cumin. As you've noticed, we're getting really consistent with our flavors, salt, pepper, cumin. If you're doing a different style of food, you might have different spices. I like to marry the flavors across all of our dimensions so that you get some consistency. So we're not emulsifying yet. What we're going to do here is we're going to whisk this. We're going to add some rice vinegar. Use that as our base here. This is not ideal. As you can see, this is a very large kitchen whisk and a very small uh, measuring cup. We make very large batches of vinegar and dressing here. Um, so I don't even have the setup to normally make this size, but this will work. So now we're going to emulsify. The key with this is you want to make sure that you let this sit for a little while. And once it's sitted, the flavor, the flavors have come together. Then you're going to add your oil. If your oil's cold, it's going to be more, prone to breaking. So it's been cold lately. So our oil's a little cold. So I'm going to be really careful when I add this. So I'm going to go really slow. Just a thin little trickle as I incorporate this in. Okay, so we do have some separating that's wanting to happen here. So I'm going to go ahead and change your tactics here. It's what happens when you have the wrong tools. Sometimes you got to adapt. So now, just putting it in here, shaking it. This is a good time-honored method for emulsification. Oil and vinegar want to separate. So you have to kind of work hard to keep them together. So if you do this method, you want to add it a little bit at a time on the oil. So I added some there. I'm just going to add a little bit more. And that'll probably be good. It's going to sit there on the top. You want to really quickly get this back down. So now you can see we've got an emulsified dressing. I'm going to keep the kale nice and big here. 
I am gonna eat it with a fork and knife, so I'm okay with this. You could rough chop this ahead of time. We're gonna add some of our dressing. And then we're gonna tilt the bowl and use gravity. You don't wanna overwork it, even though it is kale. It's, it, but especially with lettuce, it's just good to do best practices. Lettuce, you can bruise really easily. Kale, obviously, we're not worried about bruising it, but we're still gonna dress it. You can feel how much it's covered. I'm gonna add a little bit more. So now we've got some nicely dressed kale. And now we're ready to plate. And we're gonna anchor the plate with a little bit of kale. Nice bed of greens to eat. You wanna make sure that it just kinda of falls down. Then we're gonna take our empanadas. Now we've got our cauliflower. We'll put that on a margin. You wanna make sure you're showing everything on the plate. So you don't wanna bury anything so that you can't see it. But we're gonna take a few of our sauteed scallion microgreens here, layer them there, and take our escaveche, put a little here on the side. And last but not least, we're gonna clip some of these microgreens, these beautiful red sorrel, and garnish over the top. So now we have two plates here. I kind of just threw together some things that I grabbed. I know it seems like there's a lot here, but it's like, I didn't plan this meal at all. I kind of wanted to show you what happens if I just go to the pantry and grab a couple of things. So we're gonna have pie dough regularly available downstairs. So I grabbed some pie dough, I grabbed some squash, I grabbed some kale, I grabbed some cauliflower, I had some microgreens, some escabeche, I made a little dressing. I just sauteed some of my vegetables. I dressed the kale. I added the microgreens and I made my empanadas. So it's really worth always just thinking about like taking the ingredients you have, thinking about the best way to prepare them and you can just put them together on the plate. And this is a really delicious and nutritious meal right here. You've got a lot of food groups represented, a lot of micronutrients, and it's a great way to kind of stretch your microgreens. We used a good bed of the scallions, but we only really touched the tip of this. And you saw like we used maybe 5% of our microgreens and they made this beautiful garnish all over the top of our plate here. So that would be squash empanadas with a kale salad, blistered cauliflower and scallion microgreens, escaveche, and then garnished with a red sorrel microgreen. So sounds really fancy, but it's all stuff we have downstairs. I didn't use any ingredients that you can't easily find.